The Illuminati are probably the most scapegoated organization of all time. Before any modern day conspiracy, there was the enigmatic Illuminati. The symbol of the eye on top of the pyramid has followed that name and conspiracy everywhere it goes. It is their alleged symbol. The Illuminati and their symbol are blamed for being the harbingers of a global government that will be ruled by Satan. The idea of an elite group being illuminated or enlightened to mysterious knowledge that the rest of the world is undeserving of is enticing to the upper echelons of pop culture. The emblem of the Illuminati and their ambiguity is adopted and indulged by various entertainment moguls. If it's not aliens, the bankers, reptilians, or the deep state, then whatever horrible plot being played out on the world stage is defaulted to the antiquated Illuminati. In this presentation, I won't be focusing on fanaticizing any of the conspiratorial theories about the Illuminati. I'm going to address the life and ideals of the actual founder of the historical Illuminati. The German Adam Weishaupt. I will also go over some early source documents from his initial detractors who were the first among the many that would follow to warn the world of Weishaupt's evil doing. The more important of these detractors was John Robison, a contemporary of Adam Weishaupt living in the 18th century. His book, Proofs of a Conspiracy, was tantamount to providing some primary source material that still exists on the immediate cultural effects of the historical Illuminati. Among him was the French priest, Ave Barul, who wrote similar excitations on the Illuminati in his famous 18th century memoirs on the history of Jacobinism. Many of Weishaupt's writings still exist today. However, out of the countless that we have available, only a couple have been translated in English. We have his Diogenesis's Lamp, translated by Amelia Gill in 2008. We also have the 2015 The Secret School of Wisdom, The Authentic Rituals and Doctrines of the Illuminati, translated by Jeva Singh Anad. It will be these works, among others, such as Heinrich Schneider's Quest for the Mysteries, written in 1947, from which I will be extrapolating Weishaupt's life, motives, and eventual downfall. The mid to late 18th century was an exciting and revolutionary time for the world. The French Revolution was bolstering, the Enlightenment era with its many scribes and prophets was birthed, and the United States of America was forming among its turmoil and revolution as well. Among all of this was Weishaupt with his Illuminati trying to take advantage of the new age to work his way up and establish himself and his order as a part of the authority of the new world. The Illuminati was so widespread that by the late 18th century, a reverend by the name of G. W. Snyder sent George Washington a letter and Robinson's book, advising him to investigate it and assess the issue of the pervasive Illuminati. At that time, it was believed that Weishaupt and his men had infiltrated Freemasonry, a popular private fraternal order that encourages people to think freely and express spiritual ideas that help shape men into progressive, moralistic characters. This group would later face scrutiny over its dubious motives and is also a notorious scapegoated secret society. Nonetheless, Freemasonry and the founding of America are inseparable. Washington himself was a Mason, among many other important American figures. The Library of Congress's online archives still hold George Washington's response to Snyder, wherein he says, I have heard much of the nefarious and dangerous plan and doctrines of the Illuminati, but never saw the book until you were pleased to send it to me. George Washington, 1798. He goes on to say that he is not concerned about their motives and that he doesn't believe the Masons of America have been infiltrated. Washington basically shrugs off the scare, saying that he's too busy to read into it or really care for the issue. He has bigger things to worry about.
Regardless of where legend and history cross, the story of the Illuminati is one of a young, radical, and eagerly spirited libertine, Adam Weishaupt, and his downfall. Adam Weishaupt was born on February 6, 1748, in Ingolstadt, Germany. He was born into an upper-class family, with his father being a professor at the University of Ingolstadt, Bavaria. His father died when Weishaupt was only five years old. This tragedy left him in the care of his grandfather, Johann Adam von Ingolstadt, who, like his father, was a professor of law at the university. Ixtat was an advocate of the philosophy of Christian Wolff and of the Enlightenment. He influenced the young Weishaupt with his progressive ideals of rationalism. Weishaupt began his formal education at age seven at a Jesuit school. He later enrolled at the University of Ingolstadt and graduated in 1768 at 20 years old with a degree in law. Four years later, at the age of 24, he became a professor of law at the University of Ingolstadt. His Jesuit elders had held a monopoly on the education system at that time and were an esteemed society of intellectuals. They have an interesting history of their own. They were trying to mold Weishaupt to follow in their path. However, he was led by his spirit to create his own path. After Pope Clement XIV suppressed the Jesuits, or the Society of Jesus, as they were also known, in 1773, Weishaupt became a professor of canon law. This position was held exclusively by the Jesuits until that time. Weishaupt and the Jesuits began to see each other as opposition. As Robinson points out in his Proofs of a Conspiracy, he became their most bitter enemy. He had acquired a high reputation in his profession and was attended not only by those intended for the practice in the law courts, but also by the young gentlemen at large in their course of general education. And he brought numbers from the neighboring states to this university and gave a ton to the students of the place. He embraced with great keenness this opportunity of spreading the favorite doctrines of the lodge. Weishaupt was using his position as an influential professor at the university to also subliminally teach intellectual progressiveness, which at that time was called cosmopolitanism, the belief that a person should be able to pursue their work despite their status in society. This was dangerous to the Jesuits and church who had held a governance over the institutions. Weishaupt would continue to grow his liberal intellectual mind, but was also influenced by the spiritual philosophy of his time. The mystics and philosophers during that era were debating on what the meaning of life was and how human consciousness operates within the parameters of God's design. People such as Spinoza led with a more rational approach, saying that our free will is limited to our knowledge and to know God is to educate and elevate our minds. People like Immanuel Kant were saying that we should aspire to a moral system, not entirely dependent on theoretical beliefs, but by practicing virtuous behavior. The extremity of these beliefs caused many variations to formulate, and among them, the many critics emerged. Weishaupt was one among the many to take on the task of creating a philosophy and society in which the subjects of it would converse and carry out the beliefs in practice. It was an age where humanity was breaking free from its conscious slumber and taking hold of its responsibility as a free entity. At that time, the church and state were closely tied as a monarch. To teach and spread doctrines outside of the tolerance of the church was still dangerous and possibly deadly. This quote from Weishaupt, found in his book titled Diogenesis' Lamp, states a relevant mood of that time. At a time, however, when there was no end of making game of and abusing secret societies, I plan to make use of this human foible for a real and worthy goal, for the benefit of people. I wish to do what the heads of the ecclesiastical and secular authorities ought to have done by virtue of their offices.
Today we condemn the classical secret societies as nefarious and the cause of the world's problems. However, in Weishaupt's day, they were outlets like rogue online forums of today, where like-minded people could get together and conspire against the authorities of the time whom they felt were not representing their best interests. Within the lodges of mysticism arose the enigmatic leaders of these forums. Intellectuals of all type were joining various Masonic lodges to use as a platform to discuss progressive ideals in secrecy without the condemnation of the church and state. Among the many lodges, Weissop found himself in the Lodge of Theodore in Munich, Bavaria. Within these circles, Weishaupt's voice grew and he became influential in leading some of the young Masons towards a new society. Weishaupt's secret society was called the Covenant of Perfectibility and they called themselves the Perfectibilist. It wasn't until 1788 that they would change their name to the Illuminatin Orden or Order of Illuminati. The order was named after the illumination one might experience in realizing the truth about religious mysteries, which the order centered itself around. This term, Illuminati, would later be used as a derogatory title to condemn their anti-establishment views. It was initially founded on May 1st, 1776. The mission of the Perfectibilist, or Illuminati, was to replace the rigid Christian monarchical rule over society and free it into a new world ruled by logic and reason. Schneider's quest for the mysteries demonstrates the tension between the authorities and free thinkers by stating, In Germany, it was unavoidable that the existing gulf between the nobility and the awakening common people should soon reassert itself, even though in a secret society it might be bridged for a time. The strongest modifying influence, however, proceeded from peculiar conditions in church and religion, not only from the sharp division and rivalry of the established churches, but also from currents and movements often teeming with magical, theosophical, and mystical notions. Thus, within this crucial age, there were birthing pains as new philosophical dogma was separating itself from the old world of religious obedience. Although Freemasonry forbade its lodges to speak on religion and politics, Weishaupt took advantage of the meetings to reach out to the vulnerable and intrigued to lead them towards his radical ideas. According to some legends circled around the post-Illuminati years, Weishaupt learned much of what he knew about the ancient mysteries by a mystic named Franz Kolmer. This Kolmer supposedly traveled through Egypt and other sacred places to learn the native mysteries of those lands. When returning to Germany, he met with Weishaupt and taught him the many secrets of the mind and metaphysics that he learned abroad. The legend seemingly started with French Jesuit priest Augustin Barul. It was later postulated by other writers such as Jean Cantelou and Nesta H. Webster that this Franz Colmer was the master of notorious 18th century occultist Cagliostro. Colmer has been associated with the mysterious name Altotas. French occultist Eliphas Levy theorized that the name Altotas derived from the name Toth. Levy noticed that the syllables Al and As in the name Altotas could be decoded as Sala, meaning messenger within the Kabbalistic code. The hidden meaning of the name was then Toth, messenger of the Egyptians. The Egyptian god Toth has been associated with Hermes Trismegistus, another legendary figure who dispersed sacred knowledge then mysteriously disappeared. Whether this is all true or not, what is apparent is that Weissop was an avid reader of ancient history. The early Illuminati was designed using similar formatting as Masonry, the Jesuit Order, and other mystery societies. Weissop's order had three grades of membership, the Novice, Minerva, and the Illuminated Minerva. The group had the Owl of Athena as their symbol. Contrary to popular belief, they never openly used the singular eye within the pyramid as their symbol. This was a sacred symbol used in Christian art around that time, which was adopted by Freemasonry. 
it would be the later demonization of the Illuminati and Freemasonry that would couple this symbol with the generic Illuminati. Weissop focused on recruiting the wealthy and intellectual, using them to climb his way up as a renowned leader. Each member was given a nickname. Weissop's was Spartacus. Weissop quickly gained respect and camaraderie from two men who would prove to be prominent players in the Illuminati's growth. These two were a lawyer known as Zwack and a well-to-do writer and mystic, Baron Von Nigg. It would be Nigg who would take it upon himself to help further design the order and refine its degrees, codes, and constitution. The refined degrees continued upward, where only the few percent within the Illuminati were fully aware of the goals. There were three major degrees, the nursery, masonry, and then the mysteries, each category having its divisions. Nig was an accomplished mason who completed every degree. He published three volumes of sermons based on Masonic Christianity and a system of religion. He viewed Christianity as being allegorical to deeper mysteries. Nig was a prolific writer. He and another well-to-do mason and eventual illuminist, Marquis of Costanza, took the loose doctrine and customs of the Masonic lodges of Germany and formed a plan of what they called the eclectic or syncretic masonry of the United Lodges of Germany. They composed a constitution, ritual, and catechism which has merit and is indeed the completest body of Freemasonry that we have. Among these two were many important figures. One of the more potent conspirators to join the Illuminati was a man named Nikolai. Robinson explains that Nikolai ran a popular German publishing press and was also a writer as well. He gave book reviews which were highly merited by the community. He was biased in his reviews, mainly praising and recommending liberal works and criticizing opposing views which held a more conservative attitude. He stirred up gossip and would generalize his competition as Jesuits, a sort of tagline used to discredit someone with a conservative and authoritarian viewpoint. The Jesuits were a disgraced and outlawed secret society that were given the same critique then that we give to the Illuminati now. Weissop, although he grew up around Jesuits, despised them and was at odds with them, contending for ideological supremacy. Nikolai had several printing presses throughout Europe, a wide influence through his book reviews and recommendations. Nikolai was a part of a growing community of book publishing influencers that were slowly changing the social attitude in Germany towards certain ideologies. As Robison put it, there is an excellent work printed at Bern by the author Heinzmann, a bookseller, called Appeal to My Country Concerning a Combination of Writers and Booksellers to Rule the Literature of Germany and Form the Public Mind into a Contempt for the Religion and Civil Establishments of the Empire. It contains a historical account of the publications in every branch of literature for about 30 years. The author shows, in the most convincing manner, that the prodigious change from the former satisfaction of the Germans on those subjects to their present discontent and attacks from every quarter is neither a fair picture of the prevailing sentiments nor has been the simple operation of things, but the result of a combination of trading infidels. Nikolai and his colleagues were powerful enough to incite hatred towards religion and the monarchs. They were a dangerous group. Nikolai was later favored by the Illuminati and joined them in their endeavors to print works of Illuminism to be read abroad as well as writing detracting pieces on their competitors, the Jesuits and the Rosicrucian convicting them of societal insurrection and spiritual ignorance. Much of what we now know about Weishaupt and the Illuminati's doctrines came from letters found after raids were conducted by the authorities in Zwack's home. It appears that the organization had a front of liberalism, preaching free thought and subjective morality, reaching towards a universal spiritualism. 
However, once the initiate moves higher in the order, they were to be desensitized to atheism and a sort of communism in which riches and individuality were to be extracted towards the higher interests of the goal or its leaders. As is presented in a letter from Weissop to Zwack in Robinson's book, Proofs of a Conspiracy. We must be particularly careful about the books which we recommend. I shall confine them at first to moralist and reasoning historians. This will prepare them for a patient reception in the higher classes of works of a bolder flight, only fit for the strongest stomachs. We see here that Weishaupt wanted to incrementally prepare his subjects for a radical change in beliefs. The early detractors of the Illuminati, such as Robison, accused the Illuminati of attempting to overthrow the government, destroy Christianity and the church, disrupt family values, abolish private property and finances, to turn the world into a dystopia where everyone was equal except those at the top which would reap all the benefits of its labor. Their goals were specifically outlined by Robison as the abolishment of all ordered government, abolishment of inheritance, abolishment of private property, abolishment of patriotism, abolishment of family, and the abolishment of religion. Weishaupt was seen as sinister and manipulative, attempting to create a new world order, one that the elite of the mystery societies would rule, leaving their subjects in a stupor over what knowledge they might be fed from the upper echelon. At one point in the late 1770s, it was recorded by Zwack that their membership had grown to about 600 people, all scattered around Europe, operating in secrecy among Masonic lodges and other secret societies. This number is said to have grown close to 3,000 by the time of their exposure and downfall. In one letter from Zwack, we see him boasting that, at Munich, we have bought a house and by clever measures have brought things so far that the citizens take no notice of it and even speak of us with esteem. We can openly go to the house every day and carry on the business of the lodge. This is a great deal for this city. In the house is a good museum of natural history and apparatuses for experiments, also a library which daily increases. The garden is well occupied by botanic specimens, and the house in the whole has the appearance of a society of zealous naturalists. He continues with, We have been very successful against the Jesuits, and brought things to such a bearing that their revenues, such as the mission, the golden alms, the exercises, and the conversion box, are now under the management of our friends. So are also their concerns in the university and the German school foundations. The application of all will be determined presently, and we have six members and four friends in the court. This has cost our Senate some nights want of sleep. Two of our best youths have got journeys from the court, and they will go to Vienna, where they will do us a great service. All the German schools and the benevolent society are at last under our direction. Their means of operation were further expressed in Weishaupt's letters, such as follows. The great strength of our order lies in its concealment. Let it never appear in any place in its own name, but always covered by another name and another occupation. None is fitter than the three lower degrees of Freemasonry. The public is accustomed to it, expects little from it, and therefore takes little notice of it. Next to this, the form of a learned or literary society is best suited to our purpose, and had Freemasonry not existed, this cover would have been employed, and it may be much more than a cover, it may be a powerful engine in our hands. By establishing reading societies and subscription libraries, and taking these under our direction, and supplying them through our labors, we may churn the public mind which way we will. By this plan, we shall direct all mankind in this manner, and by the simplest means, we shall set all in motion and in flames. The occupations must be so allotted and contrived that we may, in secret, influence all political transactions. The allegory on which I am to found the mysteries of the higher orders is the fire worship of the Magi. We must have some worship. Let there be light, and there shall be light. This is my motto, and is my fundamental principle.
Here in this quote, Weissop admits that he is masking the higher degrees under the symbolism of Zoroastrianism, the ancient religion of the Persian Empire, which influenced many of the world's religions and occult systems. It was to be used as a lure to pull in the intrigued to further indoctrinate them into a loyalty system, only using the vulnerable towards the Illuminati's destructive political goals. This is further expressed in a letter titled, Spartacus to Cato, February 6, 1778. I shall therefore press the cultivation of science, especially such sciences as may have an influence on our reception in the world and may serve to remove obstacles out of the way. Statesmen, and above all, princes and priests, are in our way. Men are unfit as they are and must be formed. Each class must be the school of trial for the next. This will be tedious because it is hazardous. In the last classes, I propose academies under the direction of the order. Science shall here be the lure. Only those who are assuredly proper subjects shall be picked out from among the inferior classes for the higher mysteries, which contain the first principles and means of promoting a happy life. No religionist must, on any account, be admitted into these, for here we work at the discovery and eradication of superstition and prejudices. Every person shall be made a spy on another and all around him. Nothing can escape our sight. The trustworthy alone will be admitted to a participation of the whole maxims and political constitution of the order. In a council composed of such members, we shall labor at the contrivance of means to drive by degrees the enemies of reason and of humanity out of the world and to establish a peculiar morality and religion fitted for the great society of mankind. Weissop was determined towards what in his mind seemed like a utopia but would result in a monarchical dystopia with atheism and immorality ran rampant. He was breeding a dangerous insecurity within himself and his subjects by imploring them to spy on each other, lie to people, and conspire to destroy the very social structure of their times to build their world through the rubble of the old one. Although I must admit his purpose seemed daring and fascinating, in the sense that he was ready to organize a system powerful enough to tear down the institutions of his day, which held a hindering and suppressive rule over society who were no less evil than Weishaupt. However, had the Illuminati followed in their subconscious goals of ruling over what they saw as men unfit for life's greater mysteries, they probably would have become exactly what they were trying to destroy. Weissop believed in his plans so much and was confident in his plans as he stated in the letters that, I have considered everything and so prepared it that if the order should this day go to ruin, I shall, in a year, re-establish it more brilliant than ever. The Illuminati also had plans for indoctrinating women and girls into their order. In a letter from one high member to another, we see this explained as a system in which the young women are taught by an elder woman. It was already decided that the teacher would be the wife of one of the leading members. The young women were to never know about the male order and the larger goal. They were to be conditioned and prepared to accept the eventual society of liberal thought freed from the prejudices of the church and state. This is declared in the letter as follows. How will their relations, particularly their mothers, immersed in prejudices, consent that others shall influence their education? We must begin with grown girls. You must contrive pretty degrees and dresses and ornaments and elegant and decent rituals. No man must be admitted. This will make them become more keen and they will go much farther than if we were present or than if they thought that we knew of their proceedings. Leave them to their scope of their own fancies and they will soon invent mysteries which will put us to the blush and create an enthusiasm which we can never equal they will be our great apostles. Weissop's men were getting bold in spreading anti-establishment views within Masonic lodges. As Robinson put it in his work, one of the first primary sources of that time, the Elector of Bavaria, Theodore, often expressed his disapproval of such proceedings 
and sent them kind messages desiring them to be careful not to disturb the peace of the country and particularly to recollect the solemn declaration made to every entrant into the fraternity of Freemasons that no subject of religion or politics shall ever be touched on in the lodge. This initial warning by the Elector of Bavaria didn't stop the Illuminati's invigorative motive. Civilians and some concerned Masons continued to voice their complaints to the Elector. After the second wave of concerns, Robison tells us, the Elector ordered a judicial inquiry into the proceedings of the Lodge of Theodore. It was then discovered that this and several associated lodges were the nursery or preparation school for another order of Masons who called themselves the Illuminated, and that the express aim of this order was to abolish Christianity and overturn all civil government. But the result of the inquiry was very imperfect and unsatisfactory. No Illuminati were to be found. They were unknown in the lodge. Some of the members occasionally heard of certain candidates for illumination called Minervals, who were sometimes seen among them, but whether these had been admitted or who received them was known only to themselves. This unsatisfactory investigation gave the Illuminati more time to develop. However, the complaints did not stop, so due to civil unrest, Theodore was forced to place a ban on secret societies and Freemasonry in 1784. This ban wasn't strictly observed by all Masons, and some, including those of the Theodore branch, protested the ban. More rumors were being spread and people were becoming upset at the Illuminati's infiltration among them. Four professors from the nearby Marianan Academy admitted to the Elector that they had joined the Illuminati and revealed its detestable plans. Among them were the already mentioned disgust for Christianity, private property, theological ruling of society, and individual prosperity. According to the professors, they wanted to create a dystopia where the individual serves the system through a promising of equal rights and rewarding of enlightenment. The Illuminati was a cult, to say the least. Aside from what was said about the Illuminati, later, after Weishaupt was banned, as I'll get into, he wrote in his defense that he was merely trying to set up a system to explain the great mysteries of Freemasonry and mystical Christianity, which he felt the West had lost. He was frustrated with Freemasonry, Rosicrucianism, and the Kabbalah, saying of them that they are all sadly deficient because they leave us under their dominion of political and religious prejudice, and they are as insufficient as the sleepy dose of an ordinary sermon. He claimed to have the real secret to spiritual matters and ascension as he penned in his defense. But I have contrived an explanation which has every advantage, is inviting to the Christians of every communion, gradually frees them from all religious prejudices, cultivates the social virtues and animates them by a great and feasible and speedy prospect of universal happiness in a state of liberty and moral equality, free from the obstacles which subordination, rank, and riches continually throw in our way. My explanation is accurate and complete. My means are effectual and irresistible. Our secret association works in a way that nothing can withstand, and man shall soon be free and happy. Here again we see Weissop fronting about wanting to create a free and equal society where man will be happy. However, as is shown through their more devious writings, through the correspondent letters among him and his close partners, they were to use the guise of mystical religion to lure in the initiates to use as loyal servants or patsies towards their political goals. As the tension furthered within the towns, the elector issued a search within Zwack's home. Zwack was a lawyer and court judge, one of Weishaupt's right-hand men. It was within this search, during 1786, that the sinister means of the Illuminati came to light after finding letters between the higher members. Among the letters were found the details of the higher degrees and its secret constitution. The group wasn't always harmonious in its ideals and actions. Weishaupt seemed to be blinded by his position and goal, whereas others, such as the Baron von Nigg, the most prominent figure of the Illuminati aside from Weishaupt, felt at odds with Weishaupt's overall attitude towards the goal. 
In a letter to Zwack, Nig explained that he wanted the Illuminati to rid society of its religious prejudice and free the minds of the people from indoctrination so that they can make their own decisions as a community, saying, We must not throw away the good with the bad, the child with the dirty water, but we must make the secret doctrines of Christianity be received as the secrets of genuine Freemasonry. But farther, we have to deal with the despotism of princes. This increases every day. But then, the spirit of freedom breathes and sighs in every corner. And, by the assistance of hidden schools of wisdom, liberty and equality, the natural and imprescriptible rights of man shall be gained. Jesus Christ established no new religion. He would only set religion and reason in their ancient rights. For this purpose, he would unite men in a common bond. He would fit them for this by spreading a just morality, by enlightening the understanding, and by assisting the mind to shake off all prejudices. He would teach all men, in the first place, to govern themselves. Rulers would then be needless. Nig was excited to see an age where church and state were not tied and where people would freely learn and teach what they wished. Robison says of Nig that Nig was, next to Weishaupt, the most serviceable man in the order and procured the greatest number of members. He traveled like a philosopher from city to city, from lodge to lodge, and even from house to house before his illumination, trying to unite the Masons and he now went over the same ground to extend the eclectic system and to get the lodges put under the direction of the Illuminati. He was by no means void of religious impressions, and we often find him offended with the atheism of Weishaupt. After laboring four years with great zeal, he was provoked with the disingenuous tricks of Spartacus or Weishaupt, and he broke off all connection with the society in 1784, and some time after published a declaration of all that he had done within it. In a letter to Zwack, Nig writes, The vanity and self-conceit of Spartacus would have got the better of all prudence had I not checked him, but Spartacus had composed an exhibition of his last principles for a discourse of reception in which he painted his three favorite mysterious degrees which were to be conferred by him alone in colors which had fascinated his own fancy but they were the colors of hell and would have scared the most intrepid and because I represented the danger of this and by force obtained the omission of this picture he became my implacable enemy I abhor treachery and leave him to blow himself and his order in the air. Weisop was losing ground and soon came across another conflict which to him was of utmost inconvenience. It was revealed in a couple letters that Weisop had incidentally gotten Zwack's sister pregnant. This was a mistake and Weisop was deeply concerned for his friendship with Zwack for he was unaware of the situation as is expressed in this letter to a member in 1783. I am now in the most embarrassing situation. It robs me of all rest and makes me unfit for everything. I am in danger of losing at once my honor and my reputation, by which I have long had such influence. What think of you? My sister-in-law is with child. We have tried every method in our power to destroy the child, and I hope she is determined on everything. Here the letter breaks up and Robinson speculates that Weisop was considering that the woman kill herself if they couldn't produce an effective abortion. It is concluded that she was already four months pregnant at the time of the letter. Weisop was so distraught with the pregnancy because if they couldn't kill the fetus, they would have to get married, which to him would be a disgrace. At that time, sex out of wedlock children and abortions were all very taboo customs and nonetheless he felt as if his reputation would be hindered along with his responsibilities to the order. He further expresses his distress to his friend as follows. Could you but help me out of this distress? You would give me life, honor, and peace, and strength to work again in the great cause. If you cannot, be assured I will venture on the most desperate stroke until it is fixed. I will not lose my honor. I cannot conceive what devil has made me go astray. Me, 
who have always been so careful on such occasions. Lysop taught in the Illuminati that death brought about what they called the eternal sleep. It was a romanticized doctrine on death, which was meant to give its participants the freedom from the fear of death. This was like the idea of modern terrorists in the sense that dying for the cause is not to be stressed because nothing but a peaceful sleep will follow them. Wysop attempted to persuade the girl into a subtle suicide at a home of a member, Baron Bassus, but she was frightened last minute and Robinson puts it that she left the house and in the hidden city of a midwife and nurse brought forth a young Spartacus who now lives to thank his father for his endeavors to murder him. Wysop was left with an unwanted child. His Illuminati was under scrutiny by the authorities and his chief leaders were beginning to lose respect for him. Robison explains that the happiness of mankind was, like Wysop's Christianity, a mere tool, a tool which the regents made a joke of, but Spartacus would rule the regents. This he could not so easily accomplish. His despotism was insupportable to most of them and finally brought all to light. When he could not persuade them by his own firmness, and indeed by his superior wisdom, he employed jesuitical tricks, causing them to fall out with each other, setting them as spies on each other, and separating any two that he saw attached to one another, by making that one a master of the other. And in short, he left nothing undone that could secure his uncontrolled command. Wysop was full of pride and a desire to rule over his initiates, promising that they would rule the world. Eventually, after all the rumors and resentment that was fostering, it was discovered that Wysop was the head and founder of the order. He lost his job as professor at the university and was banished from Bavaria. Other members were becoming scrutinized and hit with legal issues. Zwack was also banished from Bavaria. On March 2nd, 1785, the Elector wrote his second and final edict, suppressing the order of the Illuminati. An interesting story that was being accounted by early scholars on the Illuminati's fall was that among the many letters that were found during the raids, a member was also struck by lightning and upon the retrieval of his body, other incriminating letters were found on his person. Weissop's beloved Illuminati was crumbling and he lost the power and influence he had over his subjects. The French socialist freethinker Louis Blanc of the 19th century eulogizes Wysop as being one of the most profoundest conspirators who has ever existed. On the other hand, we find Mackey, an American Mason, describing him as follows in the book Lexicon of Freemasonry. Wysop was a radical in politics and an infidel in religion, and he organized this association not more for the purpose of aggrandizing himself than of overturning Christianity and the institutions of society. Wysop was received by his friend, the Duke of Saxe-Gotha, who gave him a pension and a position within the local institution as a philosophy professor. Adam wrote a series of works perfecting the Illuminati's ideologies. Some of them are a complete history of the persecutions of the Illuminati in Bavaria, 1785, an apology for the Illuminati, 1786, a picture of Illuminism, 1786, and an improved system of Illuminism, 1787. To defend himself, Adam wrote an apologist work titled, A Brief Justification of My Intentions. In his old age, he attempted to rebrand himself and explain what his humanitarian goals really were. It is difficult to find any English translation of Weissop's later works. However, a Dr. Tony Page translated and commentated on his An Apology for the Illuminati. Page states that Weissop's plan was to educate Illuminati followers in the highest levels of humanity and morality, so that if Illuminati alumni subsequently attained positions of significance and power, they could exert a benevolent and uplifting influence upon society at large. His project was utopian and naively optimistic, and he himself was certainly not without flaws of character but neither he nor his plan was evil or violent in and of themselves. It is one of the deplorable and tragic ironies of history.
that a man who tried to inculcate virtue, philanthropy, social justice, and morality has become one of the great hate figures of the 21st century conspiracy thinking. He lived into his 80s and died a disgraced mystic on November 18, 1830, in Gotha, Germany. One of his last statements was that, The tenor of my life has been the opposite of everything that is vile, and no man can lay any such thing to my charge. His influence has permeated up to today in various ways. The age in which he lived was an exciting one, with a new era of mankind being born, marching through the chaos and binding of the past. Of Weissop, the American president, Thomas Jefferson, exclaimed in a letter titled, From Thomas Jefferson to Bishop James Madison on the 31st of January, 1800, that, as Weissop lived under the tyranny of a despot and priest, he knew that caution was necessary even in spreading information and the principles of pure morality. This has given an air of mystery to his views and was the foundation of his banishment. If Weissop had written here, where no secrecy is necessary in our endeavors to render men wise and virtuous, he would not have thought of any secret machinery for that purpose. Although Weissop lived out his days in exile, continuing to write and lead a humble life in Gotha as a philosopher and pensioned teacher, some suggest that he still influenced some radical world events that were to take place after the Illuminati's downfall. Early detractors such as Robison and Barul claim that the Illuminati's dispersed members within the wide network across Europe continued the work, infiltrating French Freemasonry. It was Robison and Barul's suspicion that the Illuminati or its retired members and their ideals instigated the French Revolution which brought about the end of its monarchy and the rise of a new age. This was primarily achieved, as it is told, after the Duke of Orleans was initiated into the Illuminati by Mirabeau. Mirabeau is a highly regarded figure in French history during the revolutionary years. Many historians are divided when it comes to this character. Some see him as an honorable leader and some as a traitor. The Duke of Orleans was already the head of the Grand Orient of Freemasonry in France. He had instant access to all lodges in France, thus the ability to send out messages and plans to all Illuminists. He was also a noble, which meant he was protected and left unquestioned by the state. However, he was used by the Illuminati. They played with his desire to be enlightened to mysteries and went along with their plan, which was to incite the revolution to topple the existing monarchy to install the Illuminati system. Mirabeau is remembered by mainstream historians as being a leader of the early revolution who was later disgraced by controversial political views. Robison and Frost in his Secret Societies of the European Revolution, writing in the late 19th century, Remember him as a member of the Illuminati who was a deceitful man playing the Duke of Orleans for his financial support and political access. It worked, at least for some time. The Duke was the cousin of Louis XVI, the last king of France that was massacred during the revolution. The conspiracy theorists of that time, like Barul and others, believed that the Illuminati primarily through Mirabeau used the Duke to incite the Illuminists to revolt in false hopes that the Duke would succeed his cousin and rule the new order of an Illuminati France. The Duke was later executed by the Revolutionary Tribunal for his support of the French Revolution. What Weissop set off was too big for him and his life. Others also claim that this movement that Weissop initially started grew into a firm political ideology known as the World Revolutionary Movement. William Guy Carr, English-born Canadian naval officer from the 20th century, wrote several books as a conspiracy theorist on the World Revolutionary Movement, demonstrating that through the Illuminati, a continued chain of ideology worked its way to communism. It was this social-political doctrine which sought to destroy the social order of natural life. He and others believed that what started with Weissop would go on to become an ideology of manipulation that would start problems where there were none, to change the social narrative, to instigate the people 
than to destroy the social construct and rebuild it with a new norm. Those who were secretly guiding the plot would benefit somehow afterwards. This is also described as the Hegelian dialectic, wherein there is a thesis that is presented with an antithesis, and through a predetermined synthesis, a new construct is created to govern the subjects of both sides of the conflict. A problem is created, a predetermined solution is presented, all people agree to the solution, and a social change is made. One thing is for sure, Weishaupt failed. However, the Illuminati might still exist to this day in another form. <laughs>